Father, we thank you for your word, your word of instruction, your word of correction, your word of rebuke, your word of encouragement. God, by the power of your blood now, by the power of your healing hands, by the power of your love, transform our lives. God, that some of us that would reject the word that will go forth today, God, normally we would reject it, but may we receive it because it's from you. God, please, I ask you to take a coal from the fire of your altar and touch my lips, that I would speak only what is good for necessary edification, as your word says. May grace be the message of today. We ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So if you're new to our study, the book of Titus is one of the pastoral epistles written by the Apostle Paul to a young preacher. Paul, who is kind of like the head missionary, went around starting churches, and he started this church in an area called Crete, Big Island. You guys were here last week. Somebody told me, I talked about how Crete was a little area, and she was like, what are you talking about? It's a big island. <laughs> See, I learn and I grow. But the churches in the neighborhoods were small, and it, the churches were really small there. And he wanted them, he wanted Titus to appoint leaders, but he wanted them to know what the qualifications for a good Christian leader were. And we've been looking at that for the last few weeks. And today is kind of like the footnote. He's, he's before he closes his letter. Now for you guys, again, that are new to church, new to scripture, the Bible's actually not one book, but it's 66 books written by about 40 different authors covering about, um, written over a course of about 1,500 years, covering the past, present, and future of history. It is what Chuck Missler calls the integrated message system that somehow, some way, Despite all these separations, it still speaks. It's living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing, dividing your heart and your soul, your bone and your marrow. It discerns your thoughts and your intents, goes into your heart when you read it. It's like reading a love letter for the first time if it's to you. And if you don't know Jesus, it's like reading somebody else's mail. That's why if you tell somebody about the Bible, and they don't know the Lord. They, what are you, a book written by men? What are you crazy? They flip out. It's like, listen, you could get a love letter written to you also. All you got to do is receive Jesus. What? They go crazy. Well, as a footnote, he wants to remind him, Paul wants to remind Titus a few other things. Oh, yeah, that's right. Here's what else I want you to tell them, he says. Verse 1, chapter 3, the book of Titus. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. Please give me your attention. A few years ago, we used to do what's called crowd reduction services. <laughs> Because we didn't want our church growing too big that we couldn't be involved in each other's lives. We were not looking for a, a big fellowship. Every once in a while I would teach a service where everybody would walk away and they'd go, that's a hard saying, who could hear it? But the truth is they walk away going, that guy's nuts, I'm out of here. Who, how dare he say that to me? Today's one of those services. <laughs> you chose the right day. <laughs> but by the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray that your heart would receive what I'd have to say because the things I'm going to tell you have, have really been a giant aid to my growth in Christ. He says, I want to remind you to be subject to rulers and authorities to obey. Now, we fall under one of two different realms in, in the body of Christ. It's either those who don't believe the government has any say-so, the things, I'm not going to give them anything, they, and they, they completely separate themselves. I'm not going to pay my taxes, I'm not going to obey this, I'm not even going to stop at the next stop sign I see. And here, he says, listen, we all want to overthrow the government, but there's a right way and a wrong way. He wants you to obey. He wants you to pay your taxes. For God is greater even than the government. Now there is a fine line. For the Bible does say in the book of Acts that should we obey God or man. There is a time when they outlaw the gathering of the brethren, when they outlaw the Bible itself, that we will have to disobey the government. There is a time coming, and I don't know where that line is, guys. It's a fine line, and it exists, and I wish I could tell you where it is. 
But this bleeds over, this spills over into another area of our lives, especially in this day and age. The one thing that separates those that are successful in their Christian walk is the word submission. Subject to rulers and authorities. Submission. Just the very, very mention of that word, some of you ladies' hearts are like, oh, he's not gonna. Oh, no way, he ain't going there. In ministry, I've seen pastors succeed and I've seen them fail. And the vast majority of the pastors that I've seen fail, a guy goes out and he starts a church with hope and dreams, and a few years later he comes back broken, hurting, can't figure out why God allowed this to happen. Well, noticing these things, the vast majority of the men that have failed, that have come back, literally tail between their legs, completely broken and devastated, they have not put one thing in place that is suggested first, at least by my home church. You need a Timothy and you need a Paul. You need a Timothy and you need a Paul. What does that mean? Now stay with me, I'm going to make this relatable to everybody, but you need an authority over you. And to be a senior pastor is like a really, man, it's a, it's a difficult thing because you've got to go out to start something that you cannot let anybody discourage you from doing. And the first thing that happens when people come to your church, your Bible study, your fellowship, is they want to tell you what they think that you should do based upon what they saw somebody else do. And anybody here ever start a business? Everybody's got a suggestion. Oh, here's what you do. Have you ever started a painting business? No, but I'm telling you, I've had my house painted and here's what you should do. It's like that with the Bible. Everybody's an expert on the Bible. Everybody you meet, even if they've never read it, they're really sure that you don't know what you're talking about. But maintaining the ability to submit yourself under authority while maintaining the steadfastness and not being discouraged, guys, this is part of every human being's life. You know how many women I know? They are more spiritual, they're stronger in the Lord than their husbands, yet the Bible says to submit to them. And they say, why would I submit to him? I know the Bible better than him. I, because that's what the Word of God says to do. Why would God want, well, why should I sin because my husband, whoa, 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 I didn't say to sin, sin because your husband says, you, you, your husband wants you to do some sick, perverted, twisted junk, don't do it. But if he's planning your vacation and you don't like the way he's doing it because he's so stupid and you're so smart, why don't you do, do you, let him fail then. What? Yeah, yeah, let him fail. Oh, that's ridiculous. Listen to me. You see the guy that died on a cross that didn't look too much unlike that? You know what I mean. <coughs> he was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He sat in the heavens on a throne surveying everything that was not. He spoke a word and it existed. And his father, whom he was equal to, said, I have a plan to save these people on earth. And his first thought was, I don't think I want to do that. I don't think I want to leave heaven to go to earth, to rescue a people who will reject me anyway. And then when he was on earth, he was being beaten by those that he came to save. He was being rejected. And he said to his father, if there's any other way, not the cross, these people, how long shall I bear with them, he said. How long must I be with them? Forget this, I'm out of here. But he said something super interesting afterward. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. 
I have made that an important aspect of my life as a pastor. I have about a half a dozen to ten men in my life who are allowed to say anything they want without reservation. And they don't necessarily have to be older. They don't necessarily have to be more experienced. They don't necessarily have to have any qualifications other than I've placed them above me. I, I think that's important. Somebody who's allowed to say, my, my father-in-law is one of those men. He's allowed to say anything he wants to me. Jim Coy, Ken Graves, they're allowed to say anything they want to me. Tell, tell me, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do it. Why? 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 Why do you always say why? Why don't you just do it? Well, what if they're wrong? Then they will stand before God and give an account. What if I mess up? Oh, that is a big part of our lives. Worry about messing up. Our, our, us that have had fathers and mothers that were so hard on us, so strong on us. Why you do that? Why you do that? You ever had that mother? Leave it alone. Don't touch that. Don't pick that. Don't do that. Don't leave it alone. Leave it alone. They grow up like that. Afraid to mess up. So afraid to mess up. Make a bad decision. I don't want to make a bad decision. Why? What if I'm wrong? Oh well. One of my favorite lessons learned was this movie years ago. It was a movie called Regarding Henry. Anybody remember that? It's a great premise. The guy is this smart, hotshot lawyer. Got it going all together. His house is perfect, meticulous. His kids are all in private school, not to be bothered. He's got his mistress and his wife. And he gets robbed, and when the guy robs him, he shoots him in the head, but he lives. But he morphs, because he got this brain trauma, into like a whole different person. And he's got to relearn his family and, 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 his, and his wife, and he finds out he cheated, he finds out she cheated. It's a great movie to watch, very, very interesting, I, I suggest it. But there's a great scene in the movie where they're sitting around the table, and the kids are all eating. And one of the kids reaches over to grab a glass and knocks a glass of milk over. Now this is after he'd been shot, after he's come back home from the doctor. He was in rehab for, for years, for a couple of six months or something like that, trying to get his motor skills back. And everybody goes, huh. they knocked, the kid knocked over a glass of milk. And he looks and he goes, and he reaches over and he knocks his own glass over. He goes, it's okay, it's just milk. And I just learned, I looked at that and I said, man, that's the way you raise a kid, you know? That's the way you, you teach a kid to be not worried about every little thing. And some of us are like that. Don't be afraid to fail, nor let the person that you're with, supporting above or beneath, fail. Be subject to rulers and authorities. Now, if I haven't bumped you enough yet, let me bump you now. <coughs> Can anybody tell you to shut up? Does anybody tell you to shut up? I'm sorry, Mama. Every once in a while, we gotta. If you don't tell your children, now, no, no, okay, let, let me make it, because I've, I've said this before. Here's the caveat. Maybe you don't say shut up in your house. Okay, fine. Okay. Is it be quiet? Is it hush up? Is it quiet down? Whatever words that you use that are shut up. <laughs> My family always said, shut up. And then when I married my wife and I said, shut up, she goes, we don't say that in our house. Like, well, we used to say that in our house. Well, that's not a nice thing to say. People go, well, I didn't know that because I didn't grow up like that. My father didn't mince words. He said, shut up. <laughs> or in Italian, stata zicce. Stata. Stata zicce. Right? Well, the question is now, who tells you to shut up? Raise a kid without the ability, especially young ladies, to shut up when they're told to shut up, and you're raising a monster. Wives, when your husband says, please be quiet, <laughs> do you listen? Or does nobody tells me to shut up? Nobody, don't, nobody, excuse me, my father don't even talk to me like that. That was the problem then. 
Because you understand, ladies, that you have a greater opportunity to be like Christ than anybody else. For my wife is it's every bit my equal. She is the same in importance. She certainly knows Christ and his word as well as I do. No doubt about that. But God has given me authority over her. Yes, let me reiterate that. God has given me authority over my wife. I didn't earn it. That's for certain. As a matter of fact, I've already ruined it a bunch of times. But God's given me. So when I say, Honey, would you please shut your flap? <laughs> As my wife, she is told by Scripture to be quiet. Because when there is more than one head in a home, it's a freak house. It's a freak. Anything with more than one head is a freak. You ever see a two-headed turtle? People go, look at that two-headed snake turtle, two-headed... It's freaky. It's the same thing they say when you they look at your house. If there's only if there's more than one head in your house. Now again, please, that's not to say that your wife is less than you, that you are less than your husband, ladies. You're not. Quite the contrary. You have the opportunity to be more like Christ. For as Christ was equal in every way, shape, and form to God, yet submitted to the Father, so too you have the ability to be more like Christ, being smarter, sharper, wiser, more in tune with the Spirit, letting your husband mess up. Okay, honey, if that's, you want to handle the checkbook, you go ahead and handle the checkbook. If you want to screw up all our bank account, if you want to, go ahead. Be subject to rules and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. To be ready for every good work. You will find that in submitting and causing your children to submit, they grow up with an understanding. Listen. You see now in our country, in the paper and on the news, kids at the youngest age doing the sickest things you've ever seen. 12, 13, 14 year olds, 15 year olds, rape, murder in, in, in ways, that you, and you think to yourself, how in the world is this happening? Why is the destruction of our society happening, especially in America so fast? It's simple, it's the destruction of the family. That's where it starts. If you want to succeed, submit to somebody. Find somebody and say, listen, I've had it. I've been running my own life. I want to put, Matt, you have authority over me. You tell me what to do. What does that mean? I do whatever Matt tells me. Spiritually speaking, if you put yourself under Matt, do what he says. He says, read the word every day, you read the word. He says, pray every day. Whatever he says, you, if he says, I want you to call me up every day, a, you do that. Ladies, the same thing. Well, I want somebody like that. Listen, we have sisters in our and Well, you come to me after we say, well, your wife's busy, and I try to get this. Did you, go to, did you come to the women's Bible study? Well, I, I'm, I'm busy on Tuesday nights, or Thursday nights. We, perhaps I should wave a magic wand, let it happen for you. Okay, from now on, when I say shut up, ding, you shut up. Man, now all of a sudden you've got, listen, it's something that you exercise. It's, it's an exercise that you do. It is an ability to, hold on. It's an ability to understand that in the end, it's good for you. That in the end, you will find yourself better off for it. Let's wait a minute. You understand me, what I'm saying, guys? Refocus. Refocus. Listen to me. Not to be a tyrant with your kids, but you teach them now to obey. You won't have to stand before a judge later when they're sitting there like this. It ain't easy. And I know these things are hard to hear. This is success in life. 
For every person who is subject to another will find a greater success. I promise you. I promise you these things to be true. As a matter of fact, if you want to look through Scripture, you will find more than 150 times in all Scripture, New Testament and Old Testament, how to be subject to authority. Rebukes are the understanding of life. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you for it. Over and over and over and over. The ability to say to somebody, shut up! What's so great about training is the discipline aspect of it. Why kids, why karate gyms and jujitsu gyms and wrestling now is so big in our country? Because parents don't want to do it themselves. So they drop their kid off and go, do, do something with my kid, he's a monster. <laughs> and some of you guys, and again, I'm not sorry to tell you this. I want you to understand this. You've been through how many schools and they keep telling your kids not? You've been through how many gyms? Oh, my kid got thrown out of this school. My kid got thrown out of that school. My kid went to this gym. Listen to me. That's not cute. That's not funny. That's not your kid's fault. That's your fault. That's your fault. We have these certain kids at the gym that I train at and their mothers every other week. They're coming. My son is getting bullied in this gym and my son is getting... Listen, listen. Do me a favor. The kid's 12. Take your boob out of his mouth, okay? Okay? Okay, stop nursing the child. Okay, leave him alone. We will not hurt him. I promise. We're going to make him work a little bit. You know what work is? <laughs> Did that offend some of you guys? <laughs> I'm saying this to help you. I promise you. This is what Scripture says. It doesn't say boob out of the mouth thing, but... I, should, I have to decipher it for you a little bit. And that's why kids thrive in that. Let me tell you something. You, the, some parents, they bring their kids to my store and they want their kid to volunteer at my store. They want me to teach their kid jujitsu. They want me to do something. And the first thing I say to them is, ask Austin. I say to them, okay, you know that I'm going to yell at him, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So you know every once in a while he's going to get smack in the back of the head, right? You know that, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Then don't come back to me in two months and ask me why I yelled and smacked your kid in the back of Because I told you from the beginning I was going to do that. Because the reason you brought him here is you can't handle him, and I can. And you know what happens? They take their kid and they go, now, that guy's crazy, he does this, or he yelled at my kid, or whatever. And their kid, his, their heart absolutely loves me to death. They call me up, hey, could I come in tomorrow? Your mom doesn't want you in. I'll sneak out of the house. They want to be around because kids thrive on that. The Bible actually says that if you don't discipline your child, you don't love him. Now our view of discipline is always twisted. The world tells us, here's what discipline looks like. What's the matter with you, you idiot? That's, that's not discipline. That's abuse. Now I've done this before and I'll do this again for the sake of those that are new here. Here's what loving discipline looks like. You ready? It's okay, right? You messed up. And I love you. And the Bible says that if I don't spank you, that I don't love you. And you know I love you. So come on. And you take the kid in the room, and you either make him lean over the bed or over your knee. Because after 16 or 17, they're so big. They... <laughs> and you take a spoon, not your hands, because hands are for loving. Spoons are for beating kids. <laughs> And you give him a whack. But you don't give him a whack that he turns around and goes. <laughs> or they give you the, ah, and there's no tears in the eyes. And it's like, and then they're waiting for you to leave. Ah, ah. No, no, you give that kid a whack so that there's a big old red mark on his booty. And he gives, a, gives himself a good old cry. And you grab the kid, he or she up in your arm, and you say, I love you, buddy. I'm so sorry I had to do that. Please don't make me do that no more. Listen and behave. That's proper discipline. Because let me show you what's not proper discipline. Ready? 
from going to jail. Why? Because my mom never spanked me. Because my dad never told me it was wrong. So now you're out slinging, or God knows what else, and you can't figure out why all of a sudden now. Our society allows 15, 16 year olds to do anything they want to do. It's a revolving door. They can literally, literally murder. In the system, out of the system. In the system, out of the system. They learn zero. 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 And you know whose fault it is? Your fault, because you might have spanked them. That's what the system will tell you. Then all of a sudden they turn 17 and 18. They try it as an adult and they go, bye-bye. Why? What's going on? No discipline. Verse 2. Whew, you made it. To speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. I love verse 3. And this is the... Uh, this is the part that always escapes me, guys. Because of the way I speak, the New York Italian thing, the, the almost condescending sounding, almost sharp, I forget this sometimes too. Listen to me. Don't ever think that where you are, where, where you are, is a bad place based upon where somebody else is. Here's what I mean. I came from this life. I'm walking with the Lord almost 20 years now. But before I was walking with the Lord, don't you know, look at verse 3. We also ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. This is what we look like. How dare we condescend to somebody else like our lives didn't reflect that. Like I came out of my mother's womb a Christian. I wasn't. I was a criminal. A foul, filthy beast who lived my life the vast majority of the first 25 years to do and hurt everybody and anybody I can. I don't sit here and say these things. You got to do this and you got to do this. If I come off like that, please forgive me. I'm telling you in, in a merciful plea, I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where to get food. Don't wait till it's too late. For one, at one point, I was foolish and disobedient and deceived and served every various lust of my heart and pleasure. I lived in malice and envy. I hated people. I hated myself. But, verse 4, when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And I love what He did. And let me explain to you, because I, I know I read a lot there, and there was a lot there, but He did the same thing I'm doing. He spanked them up one side, down the other at first, just like I did. He said, said, listen, you got to be subject to the authorities. At the time, Rome, they, this was in Rome, he absolutely lambasted them. Obedient to Rome? What kind of nonsense is this? We will never submit to Rome. The Jews hated the Romans. They were slaves. This is almost like a slave. Listen, you got to listen to your master. Excuse me? I'm out as soon as that guy turns his back. Like, listen, listen. Like, imagine if I said to you, listen, work for your boss as if he was Jesus himself. Have you guys like, are you out of your mind? Man? Jesus, ah, yeah, I'd like to crucify him. <laughs> listen to me. This is how it was. So then what he does is then he softens the blow. He says, listen, you were once as bad as him in your heart. But the love of Christ flowed from a God who is graceful and merciful. When His love flooded your heart, He changed everything for you, so let Him continue this good work. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. You didn't earn it. It's not like God looked down from heaven and said, I love Barbie. She's so beautiful and she's so smart, so I'm going to save her. No! He looked down from heaven and said, Gerald, you're nasty and foul and filthy and there's nothing redeeming about you. You're the perfect candidate for, for me to love and for me to use and for me to show the world 
how awesome my power is through you. Amen. Isn't that great? So I guess the bottom line is like Pastor Ken always says, being called by Christ, it's not a compliment, <laughs> but it is an honor. Continuing, verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Good works. This is what we've been talking about. This is what I'm trying to tell you. Remember now, we're talking about a missionary who planted a church telling a pastor what to tell his people. He literally is now telling me to tell you, get out and do something. Get out and do something. My job as a pastor is not to just teach you the word and you leave, and then you come back next week. It's not my job. My job is to say, listen, convalescent ministry, let's do it. Anybody here know anybody in prison? Let's do it. Anybody here not involved in foster care? Let's do it. Bible says 300 some odd times, take care of the widow and the orphan and the stranger. And I say, how many of you guys are involved in foster care? And five of you guys raise your hand. I go, What? Oh, well, we're really busy right now. Oh, really? Well, I hope God don't say that when we get to the gates of heaven. Ding dong, hi, I'm home. I finally, I died, and I'm ready to get to heaven. Sorry, God's busy right now. Can you wait a little while? Because there's kids that are dying. Literally dying. They're getting killed by drug addict parents and a system that thinks, let's just give him whatever he wants. That'll help. If you've been involved in a foster care system at all, let me tell you, some of the most spoiled, self-entitled, self-righteous little turds you've ever met in your life. You're a foster care kid? You're wearing like Jordash, what's the popular gene these days? <laughs> Jordash, not it, huh? Look, I've been wearing Levi's for 20 years. That's all I've ever worn. I don't know, I don't know. When I was growing up, it was like, ooh la la baboon or something like that. Sassoon, baboon. I'm telling you, they get anything they want. So what am I, and why am I putting them down? Because we need to get in there and help them. We need to save them from all those things, themselves and the system. Come on. And here's what I get all the time. Listen, me and my wife could hardly get along ourselves. We, we, our house is a mess. Yeah, well, so is mine. Do it anyway. Oh, no, no, you don't understand. No, you don't understand. This is the call that you have from God. I will say to you, I never knew you. Depart from me. Well, when I was in prison, did you visit me? When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? No, but I went to church every week. Fantastic! <laughs> Did you at least serve in the children's ministry? No, I don't know the Bible. Well, how else are you going to get to know the Bible? It's the greatest thing in the world to teach the Bible to kids for the first time and go, wow, I didn't know. God, you see this? This is cool. This is cool. The whole Noah thing, man, that's cool. I heard there was dinosaurs on the boat. Dinosaurs. What does it say dinosaurs? Oh, yeah, that Leviathan thing. Get out here. You think I know the whole Bible? Guys, honestly, you think I know it? And like I come up here and that's it. I just no. All week long I'm studying to come here and make you guys think I know what I'm talking about. I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm reading it now going, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Maintain good works. Yeah, let's do that. I want to be small enough to be involved. Verse 9. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Listen, to, to his leadership, to the guys that, he says, listen, here's the things that you don't do. Here's some, again, remember he was going through a list. And Paul did that. All, often all his letters, you'll see he, he really bullseyes the points he wants to make. And then the last few verses of his letter, he says, oh yeah, and do this, 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 this. And this is one of those situations where he's, he's going through the list of things that he wants to remind him not to forget. He says, don't argue about genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law. Foolish disputes. Let me explain to you. Where did Cain get his wife from? 
Why does it say that Adam bit an apple when there's no apples in the Middle East? Why does it say in one in one gospel that there was 12 apostles and why does it say in one book that there was 12 tribes of Israel? He says, don't argue with those things. He says, people are just foolish. They, they were looking something. Don't argue with genealogy, foolish disputes, especially things that have to do with the law. You know, I've heard this, in heaven you won't be able to eat meat. So you should be a vegetarian, a vegan now. <laughs> There's a story just last week in the paper about a guy who was lost in the woods for like three months. Did you guys see that? He ate his dog. I thought, I like this guy. <laughs> this guy's got perspective, man. I will die in the wilderness with my dog. That's why God gave me the dog, to eat him in case times get bad. This is the excuse for having big dogs. <laughs> Things go really bad, you eat the dog. <laughs> I'm going to argue about silly things like that. Don't do it. Don't let, don't let these things... It says that the law... The Bible, the Lord Jesus actually said this, that no man can marry a woman until he is fully divorced from his old wife. And he wasn't talking about men and women. Woman. He was talking about the Pharisees had to completely divorce themselves. Listen to me. You cannot receive the New Testament until you've released the Old Testament to what it was for. And that was to allow you to see how sinful you are. You look at the Old Testament, you see the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt. You look at them and you go, can't do it. And never going to be able to do it. And God says, of course you can't receive Jesus as your Savior. He's the one who can rescue you from that. Really? Is that what it's for? That's what the Bible says. It's not there to keep the law. You don't have to eat your dog. I'm just kidding. I'm just trying to let you see this. You know how many people argue? You get to a pastor's conference. You, you talk to somebody. Just this week, I did a, a wedding yesterday. And there's a guy there, and he's from an ultra-Pentecostal church. And he's just going to argue with me. He's going to, well, here's what I believe. And here's what I like. Look, dude, I don't care what you believe. How's that sound? <laughs> does that, does that, is that hurt, offend you? I saw him yesterday. First, we had the rehearsal. Me and my wife, we went to a rehearsal dinner. And he's going to tell me, oh, here's how you should run your church. And here's, here's, here's. <laughs> Dude, I just want to marry these people. You're making this miserable for me. Well, here's what I think. And here's what I think. Let's pray for these people's wedding, that their marriage lasts longer than your last one. <laughs> I didn't say all those things. <laughs> Believe me, I wanted to. Matter of fact, when we left there, my wife was like, Honey, I am so proud of you. <laughs> she did. She actually said that. So proud of you because generally she knows my faces and she knows when it's coming. Well, I'm like Mount Vesuvius, you know what I mean? At first it's just like this, and then it's like this, and then it's like this. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 10. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person, person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. A divisive person. A divisive person. Do you know what I heard? Do you know what I heard? You know Hunter doesn't like Leah. You know Leah doesn't like Hunter. Why are you telling me that Leah doesn't like Hunter? Because Hunter told me that Leah doesn't like him. They don't even know each other. <laughs> You're being divisive. Do you agree with Ryan? Ryan said something I really disagree with. Did you talk to Ryan about it? No, I want to talk to you about it. Why? 
Because that's what divisive people do. So you bring them all together and you go, listen, you're being divisive. We don't need that in the church, so I'm going to ask you to stop. And then again, they do it again. And you give them another chance. And they do it again. And then it says, you know what you do? Reject them. And you can circle that word for reject and right next to it you can write, cast out. Throw them out. Oh, that's not very graceful. I don't care. I can't... Look, I only make a few people happy a day, and I've done that with my wife and kids this morning. You're out of luck today. <laughs> At this point in time, I'm done. Just like you're done. I see it in some of your faces. <laughs> but in seriousness, that's what we try to do at this church. I see you, and I see you're in here, especially single sisters. I want to make sure you're safe here, first and foremost. I'm watching my brothers closely. I've got some very attractive, young, single sisters in our church, and they will be safe when they're here. This is not a meat market. This is not a place to meet your bride. And if God so sets that up, praise God, He'll inform us. Let me make sure you guys, you single sisters, are safe when you're here. If anybody... You feel hit on, come upon, anything like that. You come and, you come and tell us. We take care of that. Same way with you, with you brothers. There's a sister coming in here and you think she's giving you them googly eyes? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, we giggle about that, but we know that whole sex look you all have. Leave, leave that outside. You know what? Leave that outside. Just one place, find yourself not doing that. I mean, that's what I try to do when I get here. I try to make this place just a holy place for me. When I walk through that, it's just one place where I don't want to... I just want you to be safe here, and I want to be safe here. Device a person, get, get them out. Get them out of here. Because you know why? They're warped, and they're sinning, and they're self-condemned. When they want to come here and be right, then they can be right. Verse 12, here's where we bring it to a close. When I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Send Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. I love the little details. He just throws out the little details. I, I want you to understand this. This was really, guys, wrap your head around this. And this is where we, again, this is where we close. Wrap your head around this. Would you come and play? This letter was written over 2,000 years ago. This was really a letter that a guy wrote knowing he was under the influence and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he gave it to another person and said, listen, bring this to Crete. It's going to take you a couple of months, but I want you to get it there because the churches there really need you. And he brings it, and there's little details in the information here. Like, Tychicus, Artemis, Nicopolis, Zenos, the lawyer, Apollos. On the okay, got it. Got the instruction. And somehow, 2,000 years later, here we are. Finding ourselves poked, <clears throat> prodded, <clears throat> offended, <clears throat> encouraged that, wow, somebody is really trying to do something different. Now, some of you guys have very little hope in the things that I'm saying. It's like, it's never going to happen. A little bit at a time it happens. A little bit at a time. Embrace the message. Embrace it. Don't reject it. I haven't done an old-fashioned altar call in a while. So I'm going to do one today. So you that don't know Jesus, prepare your heart. I'm going to give you an opportunity to know Him. And to make a commitment to Him. And to stand up and to offer Him your life. For you that maybe just need a renewal. Today's your day too. Leah's going to play a little bit, and the music is there to soften your heart. Not a trick. I'm not trying to, to make some kind of... I don't know what the words are, but I'm thinking of them. There you go. I'm not, I don't want to manipulate you. It's got to be a real decision, because I want every decision that you make here to be sincere. 
So, if you have accepted Christ as your Savior, but you've seen no fruit, then maybe when you accepted Him as your Savior, you didn't make Him Lord. You didn't put Him in that place on the throne. You have a heart in the center of your being. Not your beating heart, but the heart. And there's a, a throne. There's a, literally a, a, a seat there. And sitting on that, some of us, it's music. Music is the center of our heart. Man, you live for it. You know every song that comes on the radio. And even though you're singing things you know you shouldn't, because of the faith that you profess, man, that idol is still there. Some of us, it's our vehicles, our cars. Man, you don't care if you ain't got enough rent money. That car is going to have a new... Some of us, it's our relationships, especially the sisters. Some of you sisters, man, you really love Jesus, but you can't. You don't want to be lonely. And you're afraid that this dude might be your last chance. Some of you brothers, it's your pornography. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's on your phone. It's in your computer. It's in your mind. It's branded in your mind night and day. This is your chance to take it off. Spiritually speaking, take it off and put Christ as the Lord now. Not just Savior. Not just I go to church and I believe, but now I believe and I want to live for Him. Yeah, it's going to be difficult at first and there'll be slips and stumbles. We serve a can-do God. See the last line again in the verse that we just read? Let me read it to you again. He said, Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. God knows what you did last night. He knows what you did last week. He's seen it. He's with you. And He still loves you. Amen, bro. Amen. Just like Leonard came up, you too, if you want to accept Christ as your Savior, you want to make Him Lord, you can't. come on up now. Come on up. And right at the foot of the cross, kneel or stand or whatever it is, just to say, Lord, it's time to make Him Lord. Listen to me. You don't have to come forward to accept Christ as your Savior. But it's good for your soul to know you've done it. Plus, look what He did. Hung naked and beaten on a cross. So that there would be no doubt in your mind that He did this for you. <coughs> in a room, pray. And you who are afraid, do not be afraid anymore. These, these, these are the things that make it real. I've been faking far too long. I've been trying far too long in my own strength. Now by the power of God's Holy Spirit, do it. Together we'll do it. We'll do it together.
Either join these that are up here now or stand to your feet. Make him Lord and Savior. Don't be afraid. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It'll be the words that I give you, but it must be your heart to let God change your life. When is enough enough? That's the biggest question. I know how you feel. I accepted Christ and for five years drug Christ around in my muck and my mire and my filth. Five years of misery where sin didn't feel good anymore and I hated my life. Even though I had everything I thought I would need for happiness, I was still miserable. If you know what I'm talking about, come on. You need power. You need power. You can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. Who cares what somebody else thinks? Who cares? Somebody might think something. Who cares?
change your faith. doesn't matter. Father, we call upon you now. We've heard of the power of your Holy Spirit. We've read about it, and we've heard it fall on other people, but now we need it in our lives to help us to say no to those things that are causing us pain and shame. Spirit, we need you more than ever. Forgive us if we've neglected you. Lord Jesus, send your Spirit upon us now to help us stop. We're not afraid, and we believe. Your Word tells us you offer your Spirit. Well, God, pour your Spirit out now.